Hello and welcome again to Conscious TV. I'm Ian McNay and our guest in the studio today is Christopher Titmus. Hi Christopher. And Christopher is a Dharma teacher and he's written about 14 books. I have a few here. An Awakened Life, which is some biographical stories. Light on Enlightenment, Revolutionary Teachings on the Inner Life. And Transforming Our Terror, which was inspired by the 7 11 um, attacks. So, Krista, let's start by asking you what is a Dharma teacher? Um, the word Dharma is a Sanskrit word and it means teachings and practices which contribute to opening up of the heart, realization, a free and liberated way of life. And the word Dharma is a key concept in the Indian tradition and one essentially used uh, by the Buddha to describe his teachings. So I'm a small uh, servant of the Dharma. That's what I do. Okay. And let's just, just look back at how your whole yes. journey started. And one of the things when I was researching the book that came up, which I, I thought was great, actually, that the school you went to, you were caned more times than any other pupil for misbehaving. And I thought, there's someone that's going somewhere in life. So how was um, that? Dub a dubious honour, I, <laughs> I have to say. So um, I was brought up. Uh, on a council housing estate, New Addington, just outside Croydon in Surrey. Well, yes. And my dear parents, my mother being a Catholic, desperately keen for me to go to a Roman Catholic school. So I went to the John Purley School. And um, I didn't cooperate, I would say, very much in the classroom there. So the caning was the form of a whalebone and uh, one stretched the hand out and one either got two, four, six or eight strokes according to what one had done. So I, would, I was the prankster. I dismantled the teacher's desk. Um, I put herrings under the floorboards and uh, other brought goldfish into the swimming pool at school. So for this I got the caning. So it, it broke the school record. I guess you were quite popular with, with the other pupils too, weren't you? Um, uh, fairly popular, yeah, well, you could, one might say. <laughs> uh, um, but at the age of 15, um, enough was enough yes. for me, being yeah. at the school, so um, I left the school. And I think that you left with no qualifications at all. N n n none, none, no, I didn't. Uh, but you got yourself a job as a journalist working for uh, a Roman Catholic newspaper to start yes, with. Yes, so... I uh, started off as the office boy, you know, doing the filing, running the messages, uh, etc. But I had wanted to be a journalist. And in my childhood, I thought a journalist was somebody who made journeys to write. So that was my, my little boy's mindset. And so I worked for the universe. Which I like. I work for the universe. It's rather nice. Still, I'm still working for the universe. The newspaper, yes. And um, then I worked as a London reporter for the Irish Independent. Yes. And then in my early 20s, around 22, I um, started the hitchhiking uh, across Europe and through to India. And you left with just £50 in your pocket? So I had uh, £50, and um, that went down to £39 because there was uh, some big drop in value uh, in, with the Labour go uh, government. But somehow or other, I got by on it for the next, well, 10 years, you could say. You survived on £39 pounds for you 10 could, years, you could say. Yeah. And, what, and what was kind of motivating you to travel? Um, um, uh, two things. Uh, um, one was definitely a certain level of disillusionment, both with uh, the church, the Catholic Church, one, and secondly with politics being a journalist working in Fleet Street uh, there. And the other aspect, feeling that the world is such a extraordinary place and I want to be 
connected and involved and listened to other cultures and environments. And at that point, uh, India had a certain, whatever reason, magnetic pull. Partly the hippie culture, of which I was a supporter member. And I think you were reading books uh, by Jack Kerouac and Alan Watts, and so you were getting into the kind of the literature side as well. Exactly. So in making the journey through Europe, Turkey, Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, into India and Nepal, and benefiting from the huge hospitality of the uh, Arab world, I have to say, um, all that reading was taking place. When I arrived in Saranath in India, I was actually just there last week, but when I arrived there, I picked up a small book um, written by the late Christmas Humphreys, who was the founder of the Buddhist Society in the 1920s in London, in Eccleston Square. And another small book, and two things kind of leapt out of the page from the Buddhist teachings. One was, everything is undergoing change. There's no point of clinging and holding on to because of that. Uh, and uh, the second aspect of that was the importance of a non-clinging relationship to life mm. so that one can move freely with life through recognizing the changes and not clinging to what takes place. And this struck, you know, a, pretty, a fairly deep chord inside of me. Three years later, shaved the head, put on the monk's robes and became a Buddhist monk. Mm. That's a huge change. In a way, yes, I had to cut the hair, I was a hippie. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but um, having been on the road for three years at that time and living a pretty simple, basic way of life, it wasn't a dramatic change. It was like having travelled and hitched and bussed and trained around 30 countries, it was time to make the inner journey. I felt I'd done the outer to a degree. Now it's to make that inner work. And that, that took me to the monastery. And one of the things that uh, I read that you had to do at the monastery was contemplate on a corpse. Yes. Um, the, one of the teachers would begin his talks <clears throat> with the fairly uh, abrupt and initially eye-raising one-liner Dear brothers and sisters in birth, ageing, pain and death. Whoa. So in the monastery, meditation on the corpse was one of the features that we did. The abbot, the Ajahn, my teacher, Ajahn Tamadaro, um, in the glass case, he had corpses. Well, were they actually skeletons or corpses? Corpses. Right. So they had been injected with formalin right. and really well looked after. Right. And sometimes they would be taken out of the glass box and sat on a seat in the grounds of the monastery no. as a reminder there. My doctor, who was a supporter, um, brought me in a glass jar a man's heart uh, who had died in operation and the man had requested a donation to the monastery, and that, I kept that. We were taken to the, uh, the morgue, to, to the basement of the hospital, in fact, to uh, see the various autopsies when they cut open the body. So all of this was part of the teaching of learning to see body as nature, as a, a formation of uh, elements, and rather than seeing as me, myself, and who I am. And for that it was a powerful teaching. Mm. But how was that to start with, to be so close to a corpse just sitting there in a chair? Well, um, um, initially, I mean, I had seen some death on the road. Uh, 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 there had been an earthquake in, uh, in Turkey and, and had uh, seen uh, uh, death. So um, the initial still to, to see, it always has a little bit more power, power to it when it's the person or persons you know. Mm -hmm. So there were monks and nuns 
you know, fairly regularly um, dying in the monastery and one had become quite close to them. But it just gives one a, some sense of uh, balance that the movement of life is a movement essentially between birth and death. Mm -hmm. and, and the contemplation of death does strengthen and deepen the respect and uh, the love and the intimacy for the ordinary things of life and, and not taking anything or anyone for granted. And I think there's something important about it. So when you say contemplation of death, what form does that take? Um, it, it would take um, two form, major forms in the monastery. Well, uh, one is we would sit and literally meditate, look at the dead body uh, uh, there. To know that consciousness has gone, the body, as the Buddha said, has gone cool, has gone cold uh, there, and all the heat has gone out. Just as it is for that body, so it is for myself. Um, I was um, giving some teachings in a Christian monastery here in Britain, and the monks, when they uh, took full ordination, they dug their grave in preparation for their death, regardless of the age. So there has been this long history of contemplation of, on death to remind us of impermanence and life cannot be clung to. Because in society so much we push away death the whole time, you know, we kind of, I know I'm going to die, yes. of course, but I don't actually believe I'm going to die. No. And I think a lot of us have this and it's a very difficult, it's a very difficult to get out of that thinking that I am going to live forever although I know I'm not going to live forever. Exactly. And because it is repressed, it is, it is hidden from us, uh, uh, death. It, it's, it's covered up in a thousand ways. It lends itself to the intensification of desire, wanting of security and the pursuit of more. And of course the, the shadow of death haunts the life because it's not being looked at. But if it's really addressed in the variety of ways then I think we can find some balance with our life as well and, and be more at ease with life without being afraid of the death. So how was life in the monastery in terms of structure? Were you getting up very early in the morning and meditating a lot? Yeah. The uh, monastic life, I was in a, a, a very shall we say, serious uh, Vipassana monastery. Vipassana means a monastery for insight, a monastery for meditation, a monastery to face up to my existence in all respects. The bell began at 4 a.m. and each monk had a small hut. The teacher and the discipline of the monastery strongly discouraged meditating in the hut because he didn't believe us, I suspect. So he had to be out of the hut and meditate so he's outdoors. Fall asleep in the hut. Yeah, 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 or we wouldn't get up or yeah. things like that. Yeah. So we meditate on the small balcony and we went to the hall. So essentially from four o'clock in the morning to around ten at night, it was a day of meditation using the four postures, sitting, walking, standing and reclining. That routine um, I had for just over three years. Mm. And the teacher had no time for books. No he, books were banned in the, in the monastery. And he took the view um, that books destroy practice. People read the books, but they don't practice. And when he found out, because I kept in touch with him over the years, I'd written some books, he was not <laughs> pleased. I mean, he thought this is the downhill slope. <laughs> There, so it was that kind of monastery. And did you have interaction on a personal level with the other with the other monks, or were you pretty much in your own world and um, space? Um, slightly, I think slightly because I'm uh, I was the only Western monk in there for the first year or two, and being English, utterly lazy in terms of learning a foreign language, etc. Only Thai people there and one Indian monk. 
So it's by virtue of the fact that they couldn't speak English, I have no ability nor interest to learn a foreign language uh, there. So it was by default. Um, but nevertheless, um, the one Indian monk, Bhikkhu Nagasena, wonderful uh, monk, he was very much the bridge between myself and the other monks and nuns. And I would see the teacher regularly for the one-to-one -one meetings there. And he would be the translator, interpreter for me. Mm. So that's, that's how it worked. And was there a strong inner process going on with you the whole time? Or were you ready to relax some of the time? So the, the dynamic, one, one, one might say, is... Uh, I mean, I loved it. You know, I was, I was a fish in water. You know, people say, how could you stand it, Christopher? My God, it's so cut off from everybody, your friends and family, you can't talk the language. I loved it. So if the happiness and the love is there, it doesn't feel like, God, it's so intense, it's so hard, it's so, etc. So that foundation generated a lot of genuine happiness and well-being. You know, I didn't want to be anywhere else. I'd do what I want to do. And secondly, providing some insight. But having said that, it's not easy. You go into the evening talk. He gave a talk every evening of the week. 365. In English or in Thai? In Thai. So you couldn't understand? No, it. and you had to go. It wasn't a matter of choice about these things. And one's got a shaved head. Mosquitoes. About 200 of us in the Dharma Hall, the monks and the nuns. Uh, there, when there's a certain politeness in England, we talk for half an hour, forty minutes, and enough. But there, it's timeless. You know, half hour, one hour, two hours, three hours, mm. and when, but one learns equanimity and some endurance, and it was one's practice as well. So you felt that something was deepening in you as you were there, obviously. Yes. Mm. What did you feel that was? What form was that taking? Um, the Mostly, um, if I may say, um, uh, uh, the depth of love, for sure. Um, the insights which would kind of flower and emerge in a whole variety of, of, of ways, about the relationship to mind and body, of course, um, what really mattered, the looking at projections of the mind, which can get quite intense in monasteries, of course, you know, upon other people or upon oneself. Um, the dealing with the, the doubt that comes, what am I doing here, what good is this doing me, etc. You know, maybe I should be doing something else. Um, so there's some mind wrestling that go, goes on in all, in all of that. And there's a certain obvious austerity there. And one just kind of, it kind of frees up the inner life in some remarkable way. Did you have anxiety and fear coming up at times? Um, I'm, I'm never, even before, I'm, I've never had much anxiety in my life. Okay. I've been yeah. ra rather, rather blessed, I, I, I must say, given what I have to hear from other lovely human beings. Um, and sometimes some fears, you know, would, uh, uh, would arise in a whole variety of ways, yeah. And I know then you graduated, that may have been, not be the right word, and went to live in a cave for nine months. Yes, uh, yeah. Yes. So what, how, how did that come about? Well, um, I knew that I had to make a fresh, you know, a fresh step. And uh, one of the monks told me about a cave. And you, you know you have one star and five star caves. <laughs> so yes, yeah, yeah, five star cave has... Uh, um, a lovely view. Um, it has. Uh, there are not too many snakes and scorpions in the cave when you get there, uh, uh, etc. It's quiet there, and it's high. These, these are kind of conditions for the five stars. With a good view. With a good view. And yeah. I had six star cave. So I was on Kotpanga Island, which is next to Kotsamoy Island in the Gulf of Siam. Uh, there, and I spent about nine months in in uh, in the cave, um, in the stillness and the silence of it, and of course, um, um, one's not alone because of all the creatures that are wandering around, and uh, one has a few, you know, 
moments, you know, the, of, with, with, with the snakes especially. Scorpions and snakes can yeah. be quite challenging. Yeah. Yes, and uh, the, the um, um, uh, one recollection, very briefly, uh, it was in the middle of the night, I was sitting outside the cave on the ledge, and I heard this pss, and I actually thought it was a human being. And I thought, well, I can't be up, the, up, up there in the hills in the cave. And it was a, a long, dark snake, and it was hanging from a branch, a little branch outside the cave <coughs> tree. And it was arm's reach from my eyes. And um, it was a... There was a moonlit night, and we was total eye-to-eye -eye contact. And I didn't know whether it was a rat snake, which is non-poisonous, or a cobra. It's hard to tell. You really know the cobra only when the hood comes out, if it feels threatened. And it's just, I, you know, I never had such a sexy moment with a woman, I have to say. <laughs> just this eye-to-eye -eye contact. And I knew I couldn't move, and it, it wasn't going to move. And those things are, phew, arrest the... Uh, relationship and rather profound one that humans have with the creature world and those moments are, are, are precious and what happened the snake got bored with me and wandered back up the tree yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and so somebody brought you your food in the in no no um the tradition is i had the begging bowl right so i go down to the oh, village okay. with the bowl yeah it's totally silent stand outside the house permitted a few seconds person would come out, put the food in, and then back up to the cave. And the fact you're a Westerner doesn't make any difference? Not at all. No, they're, they're serving the Sangha of the ordained. Yes. And nationality is irrelevant. Yeah. Mm. And then you left, at some point you left there, and you went to India? Yeah. And you actually spent quite a long time meditating underneath the Bodhi tree where yeah. the Buddha got enlightened. Yes. It, uh, I spent... Um, Two, two and a half years traveling all over India. I wanted to broaden my experience. And India, to its credit, is, um, has a certain receptivity to this diversity of exploration. And it still has there. And I spent several weeks, so it wasn't that long, in um, Bodh Gaya, the place of the Buddha's enlightenment. And at that time, it was easily possible, this is the mid 1970s to sit under the tree, mm. so, which was uh, whatever, <laughs> lovely. It must have been quite a remarkable experience, actually. Precious and, and beautiful. And it clearly had impact because I have been back to Buddha Gaya to give teachings every year since. So I just got back from India last week, and it was my 37th year of teaching in Buddha Gaya. Mm. So something touched somewhere. Mm. Mm. And then you disrobed in 1976. That's right. Mm. So what, what, what was the reason for that? Um, the, I don't want to sound conceited here, but um, when the fruit's ripe, it sounds conceited, doesn't it? Mm. The, um, it has to leave the tree. In other words, the six years as a monk the period of time was complete. I appreciated it, um, still deeply do, but time to move on. Okay, what's the next adventure? What's the next step? Did, did you feel free in yourself then, or you felt there was a, still an adventure to continue on your journey to get um, free? It, um, I can say I felt free in myself, and the freedom um, makes possible the adventure. Okay, and what does feeling free in yourself mean? Um, it, I mean, different aspects of what this uh, uh, there is. Um, um, essentially, the uh, inner life is genuinely at peace with itself. That that that's a, an important aspect uh, there. Um, and so, so inner life means the personality? What do you mean by the inner life? The uh, inner, inner life includes the feelings, yeah. the thoughts, the perceptions, the views, whether it's lightweight, you know, when we're chatting, da, 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 whether on the deeper things are, of life, there is an authentic sense of um, contentment uh, which is stabilised 
And I would say this is just one aspect uh, 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 of this. There is um, the, hopefully as much as possible, the world of I, me and my, you know, the, the ego world, the climate or the temperature of that is uh, rather quiet, rather empty, rather, 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 rather low. But that always requires, both when I was a monk and subsequent to it, you know, just the vigilance of watching the yeah. I, me and my... So that's when you say that, you mean desire. Exactly. Yeah. Desire, wanting, reactivity, being judgmental, getting on the moral high throne, getting conceited, uh, all of that are kind of forms of desire, really. So what form does that take? It takes the form that you see it arising, yes. and you, what, you, you recognise it, and then you don't energise it. How, what is the yes. mechanic of that? So, it, I, in two ways... So, um, there are, due to, due to the kind of, some fruit, bearing of fruit, in it, one, might, one might say here, that there are situations in day-to-day -day life, with my various roles and responsibilities, as, as with others as well, where there's enough, dare I use the word, wisdom or clarity or perceptiveness, to be able to respond to situations and there isn't anything really arising that's in conflict with it. So one is, it's, there's an authentic freedom from conflict or fearfulness or anxiety or confusion. And that, that's, a, you know, that's a precious freedom, I do feel. And sometimes, of course, as you pointed out, things may arise. Is there enough clarity and space just not to go and follow it through? And um, you know, to take an example, um, um, sometimes I'm working in the political engagement uh, with people, and it's a world of strong, intense views and opinions, and sometimes people like me, appropriately so, are on the receiving end of it. And I can tell, I can feel in myself, if my eye is beginning to arise, <laughs> either to attack back or get defensive, or kind of closed down in some way or other. I can feel, feel it's something visceral going on. And um, <clears throat> other times, the words may be landing, you know, people, whatever it might be, a certain intensity that's going on. Um, but inwardly, all is well. So it works both ways. So there's like, there's a, is there a, could I call it a gap, where there's something that's happening in your body or in your mm. emotions, and then you... Christopher, bigger Christopher, whatever we call it, is just aware that something separate has happened that it doesn't have to support? Yes. The only way, uh, you know, we put it the other way around. Um, in a way, the Christopher, <laughs> the ego arising. Very good, very good, I understand, yeah. And it's yeah. the non-Christopher that I can accommodate. <laughs> very good. Okay. Yeah. So... I'm just looking at my notes, just so I wanted to get, get your journey in sequence. We've pretty much got that. You went back to England, and what interested me here was when you got back to in England to still, you still were serving Dharma worldwide, but you still lived on donations. You had a, a family to support. Yeah. But how did that actually work in practice? The way that it... Um, well, I got back to England in 1977. <clears throat> And about um, four years later, um, with my partner at the time, Gwanwin, um, we lived in a community, and the community, we were in Kent at that time, uh, about 20 of us, and we were very much supported in the community. Then I felt we were still in the shadow of London. No complaints about London, but still in the shadow. So we moved to the West Country, and for the past 30 years now, I've been living uh, in Totnes. And I didn't want to make any charge for the teaching itself. I'd received the teachings freely as a monk, never had to pay anything. It's a beautiful tradition of called dana, D-A-N-A, of generosity of giving and receiving. And I wanted to stay true to that. 
So at the end of my retreats, workshops, courses, I um, put out the bowl, three or four minutes, mm. totally on donation, and the Sangha, the men and women of the yogis, the practitioners, I have to say, um, have supported m myself, then supported my partner and my daughter, and supported her through the schooling. She's now a wonderful single mother with three children, still needs some support, and all of that has gone on. Um, when it came to the books, which you kindly showed the viewers a little earlier on, of course the publishers said to me, well, Christopher, we'll pay you £1,500 advance or 2000 I think three or 4000 was the best advance. For me to keep in the tradition of the dana, the view was I would never, and I haven't, argue or dispute or ask for any increase in the, in the advance. So whatever the publisher said to me, I regarded that as their dana, their donation to me, okay. and that allowed me to keep with it. And so I um, didn't get much in the way of advances. But, um, but the nice aspect of it was, because they also didn't discuss or argue or debate uh, with them, they would often come back to me and say, Christopher, would you do another book for us? So um, it worked well. And I still live totally on donations and have lived this way for, including my monk's years now, 41 years. That's remarkable. It really is. So it's still, yeah. you know, no, you know, not badly dressed. Yeah. You know, got, mm, mm. <laughs> and I think you have quite a close relationship with the Dalai Lama. He, he was, I don't know if he still is, but he certainly used to come and teach at your retreats. What happened, not so much that, but um, I had met, he had paid a visit to my old teacher, Ajahn Buddhadasa, who was the great radical reformer of Thai Buddhism. And I met him there and before he became a superstar in the world of spirituality, the Dalai Lama, if he was in Bodh Gaya at the same time as I was, would kindly come over to give a talk to okay. the practitioners. That, that was, that was that, in yeah. that way. Yeah. I know these days you are working quite a bit in Israel, mm -hmm. and you've also worked with Palestinians as well. Yes. And there's this, I think this area of reconciliation is interesting, is quite important to mm -hmm. you. Yes, um, extremely important. Um, I do feel, not only from there, but from uh, travels and meetings with people, that we need as human beings to, in a way, discover a new kind of discourse, uh, almost a new language, um, a new way of learning and listening to each other. It seems to me rather primitive, if not medie or medieval, that we are so stereotyped in the views that we have, the dualistic view, to use this language, of self and other. This is me, I am English, I, uh, I am a Westerner, I am from a successful democracy, etc. And you, the other, you are this, that and the other. And I think that is severely problematic because essentially there's, it's a fiction. It, it, it's uh, a projection of the intensification of differences. And in that, of course, comes the violence. Mm. The violence can only be built up on the belief that others are lesser than oneself in some way or other. And I think that the dialogue which is required is for us men and women to be more conscious, to go deeper within ourselves and with others to get past the differences. And then we start to share something. And I think that's where the discourse uh, actually is. And do you feel <coughs> each side receptive? The, um, it isn't easy. Um, this year will be my uh, 20th year of going to uh, Israel and, um, and, it, and probably 18 years now of working with the Palestinians. And the gap, the divide, is, uh, uh, is enormous and for all the kind of historical and contemp contemporary reasons there. One has to build with both communities a certain sense of uh, trust and clarity and, if I may say, some fearlessness as well 
uh, there. And with the um, uh, uh, Isra Israelis, the connection uh, with them has developed. And to their credit, there are some wonderful and precious uh, Israelis who feel disgusted with the politics of their government and their, and their military and who genuinely are endeavouring to build some bridges, uh, reconciliation. And that dialogue uh, is ongoing. And it's not easy because they get judged by their peers and by yes. others in Israel. With the, the Palestinians, who I find really remarkable people and exceptionally uh, patient uh, people, so I go to uh, Nablus, which has been the main town of the Intifada. It's where uh, a lot of the strong protests have emerged from the, from the West Bank. And I find, working with the uh, Palestinians, that though their circumstances I mean, are, are horrendous, I mean, they're locked in and imprisoned in this environment there, but it's the addressing of what Dharma language calls the Four Noble Truths. That's the, the buzz of it. Uh, essentially, that there is suffering, that the suffering has causes and conditions for it, it can be resolved, and there are ways to resolve it. And the Buddha shifted away from, in a way, consumerism, obviously, materialism on the one hand, and shifted away from the self's, shall we call it, relationship to God or pursuit of God or trying to find God as uh, two of the primary uh, focuses of human beings, you know, social, society and religion. It has been two major institutions and tried to shift the discourse again away from that and looking at the human situation and seeing that human beings struggle with life, that's the first truth, that it's the real truth of human life, and it doesn't arise randomly, there are causes and conditions, and it can be resolved, and there are ways to resolve it. And that's the dialogue that uh, goes on. I'm not at all interested in bringing Buddhism, as I said to the Palestinians and the Israelis several times. You've got three major religions there, You've got Judaism, you've got Islam, and you've got uh, Christianity. They're not going to get on. They're not getting on with each other. What the hell do you want four religions barking at each other for? So, uh, religion is best kept well away from these uh, circumstances, and then we can engage. And with the Palestinians, I work with some of the families of the martyrs. With with the liberation from yeah. suffering, yeah. Surely that can only really be resolved through realizing that the separateness is an illusion um it um it is i mean it um in the terms of a simple um uh, one-liner the, the separateness um genuinely um has to dissolve it's not to propound i feel a kind of um new spiritual ideology of oneness I um, don't feel quite comfortable uh, with that because of the diversity what I have to look at in the differences is are the differences being built up through stereotypes negative projections fear and blame is yeah. is the, is it building up? It's the building blocks rather exactly. than the result you're starting. Exactly, with. Yeah. and and that yeah. um, has has to be uh, looked at. Yeah, and one's and it's not a matter of oh one should try to be loving towards all people. I when I listen to the suffering of the Palestinians and the loved ones that have died, disappeared, arrested, shot. When I listen to uh, the families of the Israelis who again who have gone through terrible crises and traumas and loss uh, and death it's a bit much to expect such pain that people can then start loving each other 
so it's it's an emergence out of these building blocks to some kind of clarity and wisdom there but not necessarily feeling a great deal of love for the other it it, it can happen um, but it shouldn't be the end result you, you mentioned you were working with the families of the martyrs you yeah. mean by the martyrs the suicide bombers do you um, the martyrs in Palestinian uh, culture it does include those yeah. but everybody who has lost a family member okay so all are martyrs so may have been shot may have been uh, arrested may have been killed may have been bombed or whatever so wherever there is a death in some way related to the Israeli occupation yes. that man woman or child is a martyr mm -hmm. And do you, do you know some of the families who have whose children have been suicide bombers? Yes. Yeah. Can you talk more about that? Not I don't mean at all on the moralistic side or non-moralistic no. side, but I mean as how they incorporate that in their life. That their child has blown themselves up for a cause. That that is a huge, huge thing for a family. It, it is, and um, we shouldn't in a way uh, uh, forget with the, uh, with the children or usually teenagers I have to say I think the yeah. youngest was 13 or 14 that are yeah. uh, uh, there but the, the important points to bear in mind are firstly the parents often do not know until the death so that there's not like they are giving so they wouldn't give support yes. but, yeah. so they don't actually know um, secondly where um, it's been organized um, some of the extreme wings of Hamas and not all people in Hamas are supporters of suicide bombers by the way this is factionalism there um, or Islamic Jihad the other group that they um, in all the cases I have worked with the person who where there's been a suicide attack or attempt or whatever all have have been traumatized by a loss that's that's the consistent that they've lost a brother a sister their best friend a parent um, somebody matters deeply to them and they've been so traumatized by it that out of that comes the desire for revenge mm. in all the all the cases that i've um, had, had con that doesn't in any way justify or, or, or support but it sheds a little light on the emotional reactivity in which life becomes purposeless there. D d does it bring up emotion for you when you work with these families when you're with these families um, 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 d definitely de definitely so when I was in Nablus um, last year uh, there and we were in a room about this size, a large circle uh, of us. And um, the, the stories that one listens to, you know, they touch a very, very, uh, you know, a, d a deep place. And, uh, and a few times um, I've had tears, tears in my eyes. Yeah. You know, when, when, when the, in, the, in, the, in the night raids, you know, and the men have been, have been uh, assassinated by the IDF. It, it is tragic to listen to. And equally, as I mentioned uh, earlier, we shouldn't under forget too the the uh, the nightmare of fear that uh, is in Israel as well. And uh, and this is where I say we we've in a way got to get out of that box of suffering which is going on between the communities and find some other 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 kind of dialogue uh, there, so that the blaming ceases. And, and something else can move. And to the credit of people, many people I talk with, there really is a real uh, wish for that, I have to say. But it, it seems to fall on deaf ears in Washington, in London, and, uh, and in the political uh, uh, leaders in both the Arab world and, uh, and in Tel Aviv. When you say the blaming ceases, Mm. I can also see that as an internal thing, as how we blame ourselves for things and we judge ourselves. Yes, yeah. as, as, and that it, um, 
when blame, when, the, when there's the pressure of it, um, <clears throat> it, in the, it basically goes in two directions, either as you, outwardly, the other, and or the consequence, or it goes inwardly, and people blame themselves, uh, and that the intensity of blame will lead to depression. Mm. I was looking at my notes because I wrote some things down when we were sitting before we started filming and um, you said you wanted to talk about, you would like to talk about what it is to be a conscious human being and I feel you've touched on this. Do you want to say more? Yes. We've about 10 minutes left. Do you want to touch more yes, on I'd that? Yes, I'd love to. Um, um, to be a conscious hum human being there is in a way to say, look, I have this life as a human being. And I, I don't want to leave any stone unturned. So if I'm really going to be a conscious human being, I'm going to need to apply that into every area of my life, without exception. This is, that's the part of it. One would have to be one's relationships with other people. Where are the relationships gone sour? Where are the problems? What are the views I have towards the other? blame, fault-finding, withdrawal, negativity, etc. Um, am I waiting for the other person to change before I change? Or am I going to have to dig deep inside of myself and find some love? It's terribly easy in the psychological age we live in to put the blame on the parents. Oh, I didn't receive enough love as a child. It's, it, it, it's used like a mantra in the West. Rather, I think the, the, the Buddha's position is healthier. He said, we may not have received much love as a child. That may, may, may be the fact. Therefore, let me explore and let me practice to find love to develop now. So I'm not using the past to feel sorry for myself and therefore make myself into a victim, which is what people who feel sorry for themselves do. Then I may have to look at the material world, my relationship to money my relationship to goods and what I own, my relationship to food, and uh, etc. I may, may will need um, the wisdom and the kindness and the sustained contact with others. I don't think a human being could engage in a fully conscious life without the ongoing support, intimacy and connection with others. Conscious people have to be with conscious people to encourage others who are in, wish to be conscious to get together. And there's no room for any um, narrowness of ideology. You know, in Buddhism there's these cults and these sects and in religion and spirituality and a rather lot of I and my. Ours is better, ours is superior, ours is this, that and the other. Um, these views are unhealthy and unhelpful. We have to see what we have in common, learn and listen to each other, and really bring a conscious life into the personal, into the spiritual, into the social, into the environmental, into the political, into the global, to really say, I'm a human being, I've got infinite potential. I need the resources, I need the contact with others. Let me engage in this. And I think that's a real challenge for all of us. You said it in just a few minutes, but you said a lot in that time. And there's a lot of starting places for right. people there. For someone that's watching this on television and they don't really know much about Buddhism or much mm. about spiritual practice, what would you suggest as maybe the, the easiest places or the most accessible for them places to start? Yeah. Um, uh, the first is for the good viewers to have a look around in your local shop windows of what is going on in your town. I mean, I live in Totnes, it's, you know, it's the epicenter of all of this, what we're talking about today. So there's pretty well choices every night of the week. But most towns, there are thoughtful people offering programs and workshops. And that can be forms of spirituality and yoga and psychology and psychotherapy. It can be green uh, uh, issues, it can be lifestyle uh, ish issues. No matter if it's 
pissing down with rain. No matter if it's the best football match on the television, or the greatest <laughs> programme you want to see, get out of the house, I say to people, and find out what's going on, put the effort in, and, and, uh, and just start linking and connecting. And that may lead, lend itself to some reading, it may, you may connect with a meditation group, or uh, some other uh, group, and just see what people are doing. And listen in, and open up the circle. That, that's the first big step. Get out, of the, get out of the house. Get away from the television, the DVDs, unless it's conscious TV, of course. And, uh, uh, and much else. And uh, be outside and, and, and see what other people are doing. It's taking a step, isn't it? It is. And, and the, that can take courage, but it can also be very exciting. Exactly. And one doesn't have to be clever or articulate or whatever. Just as you said, and as one of the uh, old sages of India said, the first step is the everlasting step. That once made that step to open up one's life and find ways to uh, do it, it is an adventure and one doesn't know uh, uh, where it will lead. So for yourself, um, Christopher, in your own life, yeah. you know, you seem to be basically free. Do you, do you feel there's an expansion to that freedom or do you feel feel you've reached a state where you just feel free? Um, in a way, it, if I may say, again, you know, as, as uh, ego Leslie as possible, <laughs> <laughs> forgive me if it's not, um, in a way it embraces both. So, if I may say, there is um, a natural sense of freedom and, and, and natural joy, you know, happy human being, yeah, essentially. But, for me, anyway, I wouldn't want to just rest with that. So, um, at opportunities in my hometown, uh, if there's someone I can go and listen to, I might go to a satsang you know, and listen there, or to a workshop, or to uh, a speaker, whatever. <clears throat> and, of course, I read a lot. I uh, use the resources of YouTube. And, um, and I look at myself a lot as well. So... All of that is a kind of ongoing expansion because I think freedom has an infinite potential. I wouldn't want to say, oh, I've arrived and there's nothing else to be done. That would seem to me a, a rather confined sense of what freedom is all, uh, is all about. My protest, because we use the language of freedom a, a lot, is the idea of freedom of choice. And that those choices are often impelled by the conditioning that we have. And I find for myself, as a monk, as a writer, or as a speaker, speaking with you, that because both of us today have dumped or let go or dropped all of our other choices for the day, that the joy in life is not so much in having all the choices, but the capacity to kind of concentrate and focus our attention without choices, in this case on each other, and from that single-pointed focused attention, much discovery for both of us can come. And these choices, you know, wear a blue shirt today or a green shirt or, you know, I mean, it's, it's too mundane to be even thinking about. But we can get caught up in the language of freedom of choices when the authentic freedom actually dispenses a lot of choices and it's that kind of quiet free way of life and the quiet discipline that goes with it because i know you like silence and solitude still don't you love it yeah i, I uh, love it and uh it's um i mean i live alone but you know, of course the grandkids are around and the daughter and the friends uh, drop in but for some people you know, it, it's like it's a kind of heart learning to love silence, mm. to love the quietness, to uh, love the stillness, to take the walk alone, to spend time just being alone. There's something precious about it. And I find for myself that lots of renewal comes. And many people in our society who are doing fabulous work of service to other people in all sorts of areas, um, must remember 
that we are exhaustible and we need renewal and silence and quietitude and time alone naturally gives that so we we find that then we can come back in we can serve others in our small ways that we do take time back and Jesus mentions this a lot and the Buddha and and um, Mahatma Gandhi all the great sages who are so important for us they recognize the importance of connection with others to serve step back from quietness renewal and serve this is the great rhythm of life that's a great place to finish I've really enjoyed our time together thank you for coming along thank to you Conscious much TV me. and I'm going to mention some of Christopher's book actually that's very good because this inner calm is top of my pile one of his books here Spirit for Change, The Power of Meditation, and the ones I mentioned at the beginning, Transforming Our Terror, very important, Light on Enlightenment, and An Awakened Life, which is partly biographical. So, thank you again. Thank you again for watching Conscious TV, and I hope we see you again soon. Goodbye. My name is Christopher Titmus, and this is a short meditation. Firstly, uh, please uh, sit with a rather straight back. If your hips can be moved forward a little bit to stretch the back, that will give a little bit extra sense of presence. This meditation is a meditation on stillness. We are rather used to doing, doing, hurrying here and there, we can find much renewal from stillness. So just to sit, quietly keep your eyes focused on the television screen and be rather unusually still. Just feel yourself as a human being sitting here, being still, with real presence to this moment. Feel the stillness in your body, right from the top of the head, right down to the two feet contact with the ground. Allow yourself to rest in this stillness. Some of the stresses and the pressures of day-to-day -day life can fade. We can allow our whole being just to be still. Just quietly breathing in the stillness. Stillness is very important for human beings. Find stillness when you're sitting in the car, on the bus or train, a few moments before your meal or at the end of the meal. Learn to love the stillness. Thank you for watching and thank you for listening. This meditation is a traditional uh, meditation on loving-kindness. Initially, just checking the posture. The back is rather straight and upright. One is present. And in being present, just being quietly still, and then just feeling your heart
feeling warmth inside. Feeling appreciation for this moment. For just being alive. For appreciation to be able to see and to hear and to feel. So that warmth and kindness and friendship can develop as a wonderful expression of our humanity. And then with this warmth and friendship, appreciation and kindness as expressions of love, direct it outwardly to the three kinds of people in this world. Firstly, to the loved ones, to your friends, to your relatives, to your family, to your colleagues. So that kindness, friendliness can extend itself as our practice, as an expression of our humanity. Now allowing the warmth and the friendship which the heart develops to go to the second kind of people in the world, the strangers. Those that you and I, we meet every day. Perhaps briefly, momentarily, or for a few hours. And letting the heart's warmth go to her, go to him, go to them, without any exception. So that we're not projecting or judging or casting shadows upon them, but letting the warmth and the friendship and the kindness go there. And then finally, and equally importantly, to the unfriendly, to the unkind, to those who treat us badly. Can we explore and dig deep into our heart to see if we can find kindness and friendship and warmth for the third kind of people who sometimes surely make our life difficult? They may attack and blame us, but let's not sink to that level. Let's develop our practice of loving kindness as an emancipating force, as an expression of our humanity, to the friendly, to the strangers, and to the unfriendly. Thank you for watching and thank you for listening.